today we're continuing our series of talks in the Vantage Seminar on the Traza class and algebraic cycles. And today we're very happy to have Juan Lin Lee, who's talking about the Traza and gross kudla shun cycles associated to modular curves. And uh, Juan Lin, is it all right if we record your talk? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Great, great. And uh, feel free, everyone, to ask questions as we go. Yeah, you can both either you can either um, put your question into the chat or just ask me. Either way, it's fine. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to give this talk, especially there has been two beautiful talks before me, so that I, there are many um, background materials I don't need to cover anymore. So to begin my talk, let me first give you some references. Um, most of the material are covered in references, and I just want to strongly like recommend the, the three papers that. Um, has been most influential for me on this topic. I learned most of the materials on this subject from these three papers. The first one is the paper of Hei Matsumoto on, on Galois actions on fundamental groups of curves and the cycle C minus C minus, that's the Teresa cycle. And the second paper is by Damon, Rogers, and Sauce, and the title is Iterative Integrals, Diagonal Cycles, and Rational Points on Lipid Curves. And then the third title is by Alexander and Murti, the title is on Teresa cycles of Baymar curves. I really learned a lot from these three papers and you will see it from my talk. And if you ask me questions, many of the questions I will tell you to check which section of these three papers. And then the results I'll be introducing today are from the, the four papers that I had on this subject with, um, with great, great collaborators, um, Dean Besongo, Daniel Litt, Padma Serena Masang, and Dan Corey and Jordan Allenberg, and Matt Kerr, Tony Chu, and Tong Haiyan. Okay, so let me start with a quote that I really like when I think about the topic of algebraic cycles. Namely, the great sculptor Michelangelo said that every block of stone had a statue inside it, and it is a task of sculptor to discover it. And some people also say that you say the same sentence, which is that the statue is already in the block of stone. That's how I feel about algebraic cycles. So algebraic cycle is algebraic in algebraic variety, just the linear combinations of sub-varieties. They are already there. It's not man-made, right? And it is a task of the mathematicians to discover these algebraic cycles and classify them. And the point is, to me, the start of this topic is when you first heard I started out like sub-varieties in a variety, you might think there are many of them, right? It's, it feels, um, it, it might feel like, unimaginable. But the goal of my talk is I want you to feel that there are structures on algebraic cycles. It's just like when we think about in our first class in topology, you learn fundamental group. You learn fundamental groups are given by I map circles into a topological space, which of course there are million ways to, to map them. But on the other hand, if, you see, if I question out homotopy, like the fundamental group is a well-structured thing that we could start in. So this is the feeling of algebraic cycles. So here are two pictures of, if you want to visualize algebraic cycles. So the first one is if you think about a, 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 a curve, a algebraic curve over C, which it can be drawn as a Riemann surface, and then the points, and linear combinations of points um, on the Riemann surface are algebraic cycles. And then a second picture, if you, if you think about a threefold, now we can't draw a complex picture, we have to draw a real picture. And you can think about the one cycles on threefold as curves lying inside the cube, right? And as it was already discussed in Ari and Padma's talks, one main tool in starting algebraic cycles is the upper Jacobi map, which can both be defined Hodge theoretically and from Itoko homology L adequately. And today I would like to discuss how to use this cycle class maps to show the non-triviality of algebraic cycles, in particular, the Teresa cycle. And, and I will use the l adic cycle class map for the for curves over C double bracket T. And I will also talk about the Hodge, how the Hodge theoretical cycle class map is used to study modular curves in my work. OK, so first of all, let's recall the cycle class maps. And uh, this was already discussed in Ari's talk. And so the point is, in my mind, one way to think about the starting algebra cycles is it is an analog in algebra geometry that is parallel to if, if you study algebraic topology, of course, you study subtopological spaces. 
And if you study differential geometry, you have some manifolds. And algebraic cycle is a analog of that in the context of algebraic geometry. And if I think about my variety, let's say it's defined over C, right? Then I can think about my variety in complex analytic topology. Then a sub variety, of course, naturally gives you a, a sub, a, a, you know, it's a sub manifold, a sub topological spacing there. And so that you can realize it to give you a singular homology class. And that is a cycle class map. That is very um, intuitive, right? So, so the point is, algebraic cycle naturally has a cycle class map mapping to any wave homology class, it turns out. And if an algebraic cycle lives in the kernel of the cycle class map, it's called homologically trivial. And the set of homologically trivial cycles forms a subgroup of the Chow group, which we denote as uh, with Chow R subhom. These are homologically trivial cycles. And so we can further, further discuss whether a homologically trivial cycle is trivial or not, modulo linear equivalence, or whether it's trivial or not in the Chow group. And to determine that, are one of our main tools are the, uh, are the upper Jacobi maps. Uh, you can think it as, so in Ari's talk, I discussed it, it can, be, it can be sort of generalizing the upper Jacobi map uh, in, in the case of divisors on curves, right? So for, for algebraic variety defined over C, Griff is defined the upper Jacobi map, which maps the set, the group of homologically trivial cycles into an intermediate Jacobian, which is a complex torus. And every point on this complex torus actually parameterizes an extension class of mixed hot structures, which we will discuss further in the case of Teresa cycle. And on the other hand, if I am thinking about the algebraic variety in the more arithmetic setting, when it's defined over a non-algebraically closed field, in etopic homology, you can also derive a L-adic upper Jacobi map that maps a homologically trivial cycle to a Galois cohomology class. Um, so, um, and both of these upper Jacobi images as, or cycle classes, of course, can be used to detect non-triviality of algebraic cycles. So the point is, these upper Jacobi maps, of course, can have non-trivial kernels, right? But if the upper Jacobi image is non-trivial, it can be used to detect my cycle was non-trivial. And this is what I want to discuss today. So first of all, let's quickly recall the definition of a Teresa cycle. Teresa cycle is constructed from the data of a pointed curve. So if I have algebraic curve C with a fixed point or a fixed degree one divisor, then I can, of course, embed my C, or well, my C has genus at least one. I can embed my C into its Jacobian by, by mapping any geometric point P to the divisor class P minus E. So I'll have a copy of C leaving the Jacobian. And of course, I can also, instead of embedding P to P minus E, I can map P to E minus P, right? So then I will get a second copy of C inside the Jacobian. And I take the difference. Another way to think about it is C E inverse, C E minus, is given by my abelian variety, uh, my Jacobian is abelian variety, which means it has an involution minus one. I can also think it as the image of C E under the minus one involution. So if I take this difference, the reason we take this difference is that because minus one acts trivially on H2. And recall in the cycle class map case, if I have one cycle, so it gives you a H2 class in the, in the singular homology. And intuitively thinking about it is because if you think about a, a complex analytic topology, your curve is a Riemann surface. So it's a two dimensional sum topological space in there, gives you a class H2. And because minus one acts trivially on H2, we know that the difference uh, CE minus CE inverse is homologically trivial. And this is the so-called Teresa cycle. And now we would like to discuss what are the upper Jacobi images of the Teresa cycle. Okay? So we already know from this construction that the Teresa cycle is in some sense very naturally constructed. It's, this construction is very simple, right? And this is one way for you to think about maybe why we started this cycle, because it's very natural. But another explanation of why this cycle has been studied so much is it, its cycle classes also arise, uh, arises naturally coming from structures on the fundamental group of the curve. So, um, so well, you know, some people ask, ask, would ask me why I started this particular cycle. And usually this is the reason I give to convince them, which is 
we want to start this fundamental proof of a, of a curve. Okay. So, so why do we start the question? Yes, are you, absolutely. Um, are you talking about like the lower central series when you're talking about that, or? Uh, yes, you can use the lower central series uh, filtration. Uh, I'm going to use the augmentation ideal filtration, uh, but they are, you can compare them. They, they, yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, no problem. So, okay, so why do we want to study the fundamental group of algebraic curve? Well, one reason is an ability geometry says that, you know, if I have an algebraic curve, a hyperbolic curve defined over a number field, then its arithmetic fundamental group determines C, meaning that it contains all the arithmetic algebraic geometric information of the curve C. But on the other hand, how do we extract this information? Even if I know the information is in there, how do I read off the information, right? So we would like to start in what structure does the fundamental group have? So what we do is, first of all, let pi be the geometric fundamental group of, of, of my curve. And if the characteristic uh, of k of the field k is 0, we can really think about ck bar as a, as a Riemann surface. So the fundamental group, the geometric fundamental group in this case is just the fundamental group of a genus C Riemann surface. So it's a surface group. And we've learned this in topology that it can be obtained by, you know, it can be generated by A1, B1, A2, B2, and you modulo the, the Y relation that is the product of the commutators, right? You draw a polygon and yeah. So we, we kind of know what this fundamental group looks like, right? And Okay, so then we can define the, the group ring. We can either define the group ring with coefficient with Z, or if we want to start it L adequately, we can take the, the pro L completion of my fundamental group and take Z L coefficient and take a take a inverse limit over finite groups to get a, a analog. Basically, you get a group ring. And, and in the group ring, I have the augmentation ideal that's the kernel of the degree map. And I can take powers of this augmentation ideal, okay? So uh, to make it more intuitively, uh, the augmentation ideal is J, and I would like to consider Z modules or ZL modules of the form quotients of, of powers of J by higher powers of J, okay? And let's take a look at the first quotient. So if you take J minus J square, and it is not hard to deduce that actually what you get is it is naturally isomorphic to the optimization of pi, which is the first homology of C. So this is just a, a rank 2G 3Z module, 3ZL module. So this is, and this is something we know very well. And if you consider J square mod J cubed, what you'll get is the tensor square of H1C modulo out one relation. So and this structure, you can think it as, it might be easy to think about this dual. This dual would be H upper two, the first cohomology tensor squared. And then you take the kernel of the cup product. Okay? So that this dual might be easy to think about because we, we naturally have the cup product in there. And this theta in the homology sense, you can think about the intersection, intersection product given you one relation. Okay. Um, and so, and, the, and we want to study these Z modules, and these Z modules naturally forms short stack sequences of the format, for example, zero to G square mod J cube to G mod J cube to G mod J square to zero, okay? So this is a short stack sequence of three Z modules or ZL modules. So of course it splits, right? Because I'm, I have three Z modules, it always splits. But on the other hand, we, as we discussed that my, my fundamental group should have more structure about, it knows more about the curve than just, um, so this, this G mod J cubes, they are not just free Z modules. It has extra structure in there, we would like to start it. So first of all, what structures does it carry? So first of all, if I consider J mod higher powers of J, it carries a mixed hot structure. Okay, so this was described by him in terms of iterated intervals, okay? So it carries a mixed hot structure. And so which means that we can ask, oh, I know my sequence splits as Z modules. Then naturally we can ask whether it splits also with respect to 
let's say the mixed host structure, okay? And the splitting of this sequence that respect, with respect to the mixed host structure is measured by a class in the, um, in, is, is, it corresponds to an extension class. And this extension class by the work of Harris Pilt, it turns out that it essentially equals to the Teresa cycle class. When I have this, uh, essentially it means that they differ by a non-zero multiple. It essentially equals the Teresa cycle class, okay? So this is this is telling you that the Teresa cycle, a cycle class on the upper Jacobi map, actually measures the structure of it has contains information about the structure of the fundamental group of the curve. Okay, so um, and this whole Teresa class inspired the construction of what we'll discuss later, a construction called Chow Higgler discussion uh, Higgler points by Damaraj and Source that we will use to. Um, to determine non-triviality of the Teresa cycle. Okay, so this is the whole structure side. And then on the Galois side, if I assume, so recall my fundamental group sequence, if let's say the, the point, the base point C, or uh, uh, E, sorry, um, if, I, if my point E is a rational point, then it naturally induces a splitting of this short X sequence which induces a Galois action on the geometric fundamental group, okay? Which means that in this case, this, this splitting will give a, all, the, all these modules JK a Galois action, a Galois module structure. So then I can ask the splitting of the short X sequence star with respect to this Galois action. Since every term is a Galois module, can I find a splitting that respects this Galois action? And, and this extension as Galois modules is measured in a class of a Galois cohomology class. And in the work of Hei Matsumoto, this class, again, up to a non-zero constant multiple, it essentially equals the l adic Teresa cycle class. Okay. So this slide, I want to explain what the upper Jacobi images of the Teresa cycles are. So they are not just some abstract class that marry some extension of mixed hot structures or some class in this Galois cohomology group. They actually measures the, uh, the extension of hot structures or the extension of Galois modules of modules naturally coming from the fundamental group. Okay, and as Rachel commented, instead of using these powers of augmentation ideals, you can also think of use the lower central series filtration of the, of the geometric fundamental group, and, um, and you get the same conclusion. And the, uh, the slight noise there is that then you will get a short X sequence of groups, and all those groups, uh, and, um, and the, the sequence does not split as groups to begin with. So it's a little bit tricky to say that, oh, it already splits without the Galois structure or, or hot structure. We want to ask whether it splits with this structure or not. But if you use groups, then they don't split as a groups to begin with. So that, that was a, that was one reason I'm using the augmentation ideal uh, filtration. Okay, so, so now I want to, after introducing this uh, Teresa cycle classes, I want to introduce how I'm going to use this cycle classes to detect non-triviality of the Teresa cycle. So let's start with the Galois one. So from the work of Hematsumoto, we get an idea, which is, well, since now we know that the Teresa class essentially measures some structure on the fundamental group as a Galois module, that means that if, let's say it for some curve, somehow I know the full monodromy information. If I know how the Galois group of the base acts on the geometric fundamental group, then I should be able to calculate the Teresa cycle class from that data, right? And maybe that would help me detect whether the Teresa cycle is non-trivial or not. So this is what we did uh, with, uh, with Dan Corey and Jordan Allenberg. So this is what we did for the curves defined over the local field C double bracket T. So first let's talk about what does a curve over C double bracket T look like? Well, a curve over C double bracket T, you can think it as a punctured disk. And you can think it as a family of Riemann. So each fiber would be a curve over C, right? You can think about a family of Riemann surfaces 
okay, fibered over puncture disk. And there are some loops on these Riemann surfaces that when I approach the, the, the when I approach the puncture, these loops get shrinked. So if I want to compactify over the puncture, I will get a singularity there. Okay, so I will have a singular fiber over the puncture if I try to compactify it, but with, without the puncture, everywhere seems. Okay, so because the the, from the, uh, the absolute Galois group of C double back T is generated by a single element. Okay, it turns out that that single element is given by thin twist around around the side the, 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 the you know simple closed loops that get get punctured into a sorry get shrinked into a singularity. So, so the point is, um, if I think, okay, so the, the, the singular fiber, I can denote the singular fiber by a, by a weighted dual graph, um, which, for example, I can think about a family of Riemann surfaces of genus three. Let me just draw the Riemann surface for you with, uh, with three holes, okay? Then I can draw some simple closed loops. I'm going to draw six simple closed loops. And now you can imagine that when I go closer and closer to the puncture, all of these six loops get, get pinched into singularities. Okay? And then, uh, which, which gives me a singular fiber, and I can draw the dual graph of this singular fiber by, um, by, every, by, every, okay, uh, by every connected component corresponds to a vertex, and every singularity or every fiber corresponds to an edge. So if I draw this, you will get, you will get this graph I, I draw here, okay? So you can use this dual graph to represent what a singular fiber looks like. And in particular, you can make this dual graph a weighted graph. You can give the weight to the edges to tell you how fast the, the loops are closing up, essentially, okay? And this data actually tells you the action of the absolute absolute Galois group the base acting on the geometric fundamental group. So use this information, you can actually calculate the um the L addict of Teresa class corresponding to this curve. Okay. Um because well as, as we just discussed that the Teresa class coming from coming from this monochromy data. And if I know this full information of the Galois group on fundamental group, the on geometric fundamental group, then I can calculate the, this analytic Teresa class. That, that's not very surprising, right? So um, after after starting this the the after starting the Teresa class in this for this case, we were able to prove that so first of all, this Teresa class is always torsion. So this is a little bit similar as the case of if I have a curve defined over a finite field case. Okay, so the L addix Teresa class is, is always torsion. But on the other hand, it could very well be non-trivially torsion. Okay, so let's go back to the question that had already been discussed in Ari's talk. Namely, we know that the Teresa cycle being trivial, um, so if, if my curve is hyperlytic and then my Teresa cycle is trivial, right? In the sense of algebraic and trivial, if I pick Ori, you can also think about trivial and child if I pick the Wells plus point as my base point. But we, we were, and Ari already discussed that, how about does Teresa trivial imply the curve being hyperlytic? Is this the if and only if? And we know from many examples that the Teresa cycle being trivial or being torsion in child, in child tensor Q does not imply hyperlyticity. So now there are, have been numerous examples, like one dimensional families of examples of non hyperlytic curves whose Teresa cycle is proven to be torsion in the top group. But on the other hand, what if we ask it to be trivial integral? This is still open. And part of me feel that the answer, there, there is definitely a possibility the answer to be yes. And if I have to bet on it, I kind of want to bet yes. And here's why. So because in the case of C over C double bracket T, we calculated a lot of um, Teresa, Teresa classes, Arctic Teresa classes for C over C double bracket T. And we realized that when the dual graph of the special fiber, as we wish you can view it as a tropical curve, is not a hyperlytic tropical curve. The Teresa class is always non-zero. 
So it's always uh, it's always torsion, but it's always non-trivial torsion. It always has a non-trivial order. And as an example, um, the dual graph I give you, the 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 graph with a complete graph with four vertices. If I give edge length one to every edge, so this is a non-hyperliptic tropical curve. Well, so what is a hypertropical curve? It means that whether I can have a two to one harmonic, like a basically a harmonic map to P1, meaning that whether I can have a two to one map from my graph to a tree, a, a tree is a P1 in the tropical language. And this is a non-hyperliptic tropical curve. And if you ca calculate it out at Teresa class, it is non-trivial of order 16. So we have not observed any example of a non hyperliptic tropical curve with the trivial Teresa invariant. So this this is this makes me wonder that maybe integrally Teresa trivial is if and only if the curve itself is hyperliptic and the fixed point is well thrust. But this is a much more subtle question to start it because if you want to start a torsion order, for example, they really need to be careful about which base point you pick, right? Okay. Um so Inspired by this, we were wondering that, okay, so maybe this Teresa, l addict Teresa invariant actually gives you a homological criteria to determine whether a tropical curve is hyperliptic or not. So with Dan Corey, we started this problem. Um, so we defined a invariant that's inspired by, that's derived from the Teresa, uh, derived from the l addict Teresa class. And and this is a invariant that that is um, that that only depends on the underlying graph, not the weight uh, without weight on the edges. And we showed that that invariant is vanishes or is trivial if and only if the tropical curve is has hyperliptic Jacobi. So unlike algebraic curves, you can have a non-hyperliptic tropical curve whose Jacobian is um, is isomorphic <laughs> to the Jacobian of a hyperliptic. Uh, tropical curve. So the Torelli theorem that we love in classical geometry does not hold in, in tropical geometry. Okay, so this is my discussion about L-adic Teresa classes and how you can use that to detect non-triviality of, of the Teresa cycle. Next, I want to turn to the briefest Abel Jacobi image of the Teresa class, uh, Teresa cycle, and and talk about how we can use that Hodge theoretic Teresa class to detect non-triviality of the cycle. So which I want to introduce the Chow Higler divisor construction. So, um, okay. Uh, so this was worked by Damon Gersos. So the idea is recall that the Hodge Teresa class measures the splitting of a sequence star um, with respect as in, um, with, with respect to the mixed hole structures on each of the modules. And I dualize it so that the first term now is the cohomology of C. And the last term, as I said, is the kernel of the cup product from H1 tensor H1 to H2, okay? Okay, so the, the Teresa class measures whether this sequence splits or not as mixed hole structures. And we already know that it's hard to directly study this sequence so what they did is, now let's consider if there is a Hodge class that maps, that is a map from Z minus one to the, um, to the last term. Okay, if I have such a structure, then I can pull back my short X sequence into a short X sequence, so first term stays the same, but now the last term is Z minus one. Okay, so it's, I pull back to get a simpler short X sequence of mixed hole structures. So, and the non-splitting of the top sequence, of course, implies the non-splitting of the bottom, right? So I can detect the non-splitting of the bottom sequence or the non-triviality of the Teresa cycle class from the non-splitting of the top sequence. But the top sequence, um, but the top sequence, the extension class of the, uh, of the top sequence corresponds to a point on the Jacobi of C. So that the, the, the extension class of the top sequence, actually because of how simple these structures are, actually corresponds to just to a divisor on C. And this divisor is a chow higgler divisor. So the point is, if you can find a, a, a hot class 
C, such that when you pull back, and the extension class of this top sequence corresponds to a non-torsion point on the Jacobian C, then you have derived that your bottom sequence does not split, and the Theresa cycle is non-torsion in, in the corresponding top loop. Okay, so this is this is how the how the Hodge theoretic Theresa class inspired um, inspired this tool of detecting non-triviality. But this is all very abstract. This is a completely abstract and algebraic way to think about the Chalhino divisor, right? Next, I'm going to actually show you how to visualize this Chalhino divisor because the Chalhino divisor is is a point on Jacobi. It's just a divisor. It's a it's a degree zero divisor on my curve. I should be able to visualize that. And let's do that. So to visualize the chow Hegner divisor, we're going to introduce a different algebraic cycle, a closely related algebraic cycle to Teresa cycle, the so-called gross kudla show modified diagonal cycle. So some people might find the Teresa cycle hard to imagine. The reason is when my curve has high genus, your ending space, Jacobian, is of high dimension, right? You have a very high code. So Teresa cycle can be a very high co-dimension cycle inside Jacobi, right? So, but the gross code that I show modified diagonal cycle fix that problem for you. It is a one cycle in a threefold. You cannot get easier, you can very hard to get easier than that, right? Because co-dimension one means you are a divisor. And one cycle in a threefold is a co-dimension two cycle. It's one step away from divisor. This shows you that's the first step to start the algebraic cycles beyond divisors. Okay, let's define the modified diagonal cycle. So the point is, what is my threefold? Well, I'll just take the product, the triple product of my curve, C cross C cross C. And then again, I have a fixed base point E. So it's the same data as we construct the, the Teresa cycle. So first of all, I'm going to consider the actual diagonal. I can embed my C with the uh, into C cross C cross C by the big diagonal, right? By mapping a point to call it a PPP, right? And on the other hand, so this would be a diagonal cycle. Now we're going to modify it. How are we going to modify it? Well, I can also embed my C instead of via the big diagonal. I can map into a diagonal of a face, right? I can pick a face which is fixed by, for example, in this case, is a face given by um, given by star star E, right? That is like a, a slice. And then I can embed my curve by mapping a point P to PPE, mapping into this face. So you can see that I have drawn, so I have drawn here that you can imagine the black one is a big diagonal, and then this orange, red, and blue each being embedded onto a face or onto one slice of my cube, right? And furthermore, I can also even embed it onto, onto a coordinate PEE, -E, right? This is another even lower dimensional face that I'm embedding my curve into. And then I, I subtract them and add them, right? It's like an include exclusion kind of operation. The reason you do this operation is so that when after you modify it, this cycle is homologically trivial. It's just like why we are taking the difference of the CE minus CE minus, right? Because we want to kill the homology class. Once you modify this, um, this is homologically trivial. Actually, it's not immediate. I, I thought the proof would be immediate. Actually, the proof is not immediate, proving this is homologically trivial. So <clears throat> the reference for this cycle is there were two papers, one paper by Gross and Kodala, and one paper by Gross and Schoen. And in the paper of Gross shown, there is a detailed proof of this cycle being homologically trivial. Okay. So the point is now I get a one cycle, a homologically trivial one cycle in my threefold, right? And moreover, you see that my one cycle actually is just seven copies of my curve C lying inside this cube, essentially. Okay. And the modified diagonal cycle and the Theresa, the Theresa cycle are closely related. First of all, they are closely related via their cycle classes. Let me explain this, actually. So my modified diagonal cycle lies in C cross C cross C. My delta is in C cross C cross C. And I can map my C cross C cross C into the Jacobian of C by mapping PQR to you know, the sum. P 
P plus Q plus R minus three times E. I have this map. So then this map maps, let's call this map mu. Then this map maps my delta into the Chow group. Now it's a, I get a once if I push forward, I get a one cycle into the Jacobian of C. So now this image and the Teresa cycle live in the same place. Right now they are in the same ambient space in Jacobian of C. Now if I consider the Abo Jacobi map, it turns out that the Abo Jacobi image, so the Abo Jacobi image of the push forward of this delta essentially equals to the Abo Jacobi of the Teresa up to a constant, I think it's like six, um, six times, I think. Please double check, okay? So their cycle classes are closely related, okay? And moreover, in the work of Shou Zhang, he actually proved that these cycles are trivial. By trivial, I really mean um, torsion, or in other words, trivial in the corresponding Chao group tensor up to Q, if and only if the other is. So if you want to prove non-torsionness or, uh, or torsionness, you can prove one cycle and it implies the other, okay? Okay, so uh, this, this justifies that when I wanted to study Charisse cycle, but now I'm introducing this new modified diagonal cycle. And remember why I introduced this cycle. Well, first of all, I gave you a one cycle in a threefold to play with. And second of all, now we can visualize the chow Higner divisor. In, this, in, in, in the case of gross coda shown cycle easier because um, my ambient space is simple. So what is a chow higner divisor? Well, if I think about the modified diagonal cycle, right, then I have a one cycle, then I have a one cycle in a threefold, right? And it is hard to start it. So what I can do is I can take a, I can take a two-dimensional subspace inside this threefold, intersect with my one cycle. Then they will intersect at finitely many points. Okay, and because my one cycle was was what was my one cycle? My one cycle was given by seven copies of my curve, right? I can cheat and identify them essentially. Then you can think about I just get a whole collection of points, and they will give me a degree zero divisor on my curve. So let me, so that is my tall Higner divisor. So let me actually explain how to, what it, how, how we got that. So the point is, um, how do I construct a two-dimensional, uh, two two-cycle in there? Well, if you recall in Damon Rogers' source construction, they have a so-called Hodge class. And the Hodge class just comes from a self-correspondence of C, okay? So if I have a self-correspondence of Z, that's in C cross C. So my Z lives in C cross C, right? Which means that my if I consider Z cross C, this is a two cycle in C cube, right? Z cross C is a two cycle inside C cube. Now I can intersect with my, my modified diagonal cycle in there. And I'll get a whole collection point. And recall that my ambient space was C cross C cross C, which means I can project, I can project this intersection down onto the third, onto the third C, onto the third coordinate. So I take Z cross C, intersect with delta, and I project down under the third coordinate. This gives me a this gives me a zero cycle on, on C, which is a point on Jacobian. And this is nothing but the chow Higner divisor. So now you, you can visualize it. That chow Higner divisor constructed from, from Hodge theory, you can actually construct from cycles. You literally have a one cycle intersect a two cycle and project down to C, you get that divisor that's on, on Jacobian. And we know that the point is, if the chow Higner divisor is non-trivial or non-torsion Jacobian, implies the Teresa cycle being non-torsion in the Chow group. And we just need, and for that is true for any Z, right? If I could find a single Z such that um, the Chow Higner divisor constructed from that particular Z is non-trivial, it implies this delta GKS non-trivial. And 
um, before I move on to modular curves, let me actually let me actually tell you the power of this construction. Oh, oh sorry. It's the uh, no, okay, I changed the settings so that they assume I only use the eraser once. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you the power of this construction, this very simple construction. Namely, for any curve, we have we always have a correspondence. That's the diagonal, right? So that de so delta is a diagonal. That's the diagonal inside uh, C cross C. I always have a diagonal as a self correspondence. And if I take Z as delta, what you will get is pi delta of this delta GKS. You can calculate the intersection. What you will get is exactly 2G minus 2 of your base point minus the, minus the canonical cost or KC, minus the canonical cost. So this, if you recall from Ari's talk, he told you that if the base point you chose was not uh, essentially 2G minus 2 times, uh, like, you know, is 1 over 2G minus 2 canonical class, you, your Teresa cycle is automatically non portion And you can deduce it from here. Is You see that if, if, my base, if my base point, if this was not torsion, then by using the diagonal, a correspondence, you can deduce that the modified diagonal cycle, that's the Theresa cycle, is automatically um, non torsion Okay, so this is a direct application of the chalking construction. Okay, so next I will use this construction to, to work on non-triviality for modular curves. And this work was really inspired by the work of Alexandria Murthy uh, their work on Fimar curves. So they use the chow Higner divisor to prove the non-triviality of Teresa cycle in Chow for um, Fimar curves. Okay, so let me first present our result. Let n be a positive integer such that there exists a way to normalize new form whose first derivative of the L function does not vanish. And I want to remark that this condition holds for n sufficiently large. And um, this sufficient large is explicit, okay? And this, ex uh, and this explicit bound for n, part of it was obtained by the database LMFDB. You can check, okay? And if given a level n, you can check that. Okay, and let gamma for such an n, let gamma be a congruent subgroup that is contained in the following group. First of all, you take gamma one of two n, and then you add the full two-level structure. So consider this common subgroup. For any gamma that is smaller than that, or, or be covered by a modular curve coming from this, um, this common subgroup, we could show that the mo th this modular curve corresponding to such a gamma has non-torsion Teresa and, and uh, modified diagonal cycle. So we were able to prove that the non-triviality of Teresa and the multiple diagonal cycle for such a gamma. Okay, uh, so this is our result. And uh, um, so next I will talk about how to prove this result. I already told you that the, the main tool is the chow Higner divisor. So to prove this result, let's first take a detour to review modular curves and some, some divisors of modular curves, namely Higner divisors. Let's first quickly review um, a modular curve. So the modular curve x naught of n is a moduli space that parametrizes cyclic degree n isogenous between generalized elliptic curves. Right? So it's just a curve that is also a moduli space such that every point uh, encodes the data of a degree n cyclic isogeny e1 to e2. And from this moduli interpretation, um, it's easy to explain what is a Higner divisor. Namely, a Higner divisor is a sub-modular space. Is um, is a, a, a these are the points that parameterize this more data. Okay, so the point is every point on x naught of n parameterizes e1 to e2. Okay, and then I can further give a moduli problem which describes e1 to e2 together with a endomorphism with a specific endomorphism ring. Okay, and this moduli problem will cut out finitely many points on the modular curve x out of n. And, 
and I take these points and subtract the you know the degrees the number of them times a rational cost infinity. I will get a divisor, and this divisor is because well this is from the modular limitation, and from CM theory we know that this divisor is canonically defined and thus is defined over Q. Okay. So um and and this and the Higgler divisor is just a linear combination of CM points on modular curve. So they are supported on CM points, and it's very clear from this construction. And so the important thing about Higgler divisor, so you can think of it in the, our language of algebraic cycles, these are some zero cycles on my modular curve. And the important thing about these zero cycles is we have a method to show down triviality of these zero cycles. Namely, that's the work of gross Sagir. Um, if I have a new form f, and I can I can and some quadratic field, and I can consider the L function of f um, base change to k that is just defined by the L function of f times the twisted f by the quadratic character coming from k, then um, then the height of the f, f isotypical component of the Higgler divisor, well, the f isotypical component, you can just think it as just, I take my, my Higgler divisor, now leaves, you can think it as a point leading on the Jacobi of my modular curve, and I take a quotient of the Jacobi onto a sub abelian variety, right? And the height of this quotient is, is related to the derivative, the special value of derivative of this L function. So all of these are non-zero are non-zero numbers. And so the whole point is if this L prime is non-zero, this H is non-zero, and then my divisor was non-torsion. That's all we need to know. Is if this number is non-zero, H is non-zero, divisor non-torsion. And so the consequence is that, so first of all, if there exists an F such that the derivative of f, um, the derivative of l function of f does not vanish at one, then there will exist d such that making this not making the l k prime non vanishing. Okay, uh, that is essentially uh, that is essentially using chapter of density theorem. So there will be a lot of d, a, a, a congruence class that a positive density that many d. Okay, and another another consequence is that. If n is sufficiently large, then there will, when a level is sufficiently large, there will exist f such that the derivative does not vanish. Um, to prove this, this involves analytic number theory with lots of work on this direction, uh, goes back to, I think, goes back to the work of Duke. So the whole point is as long as n is sufficiently large, you have non torsion Higgler divisors on modular curves. This is the sentence. That I want to, you to remember is when n is very large, there are non torsion Taylor divisors. Okay, so how do we use this um, to study our? So now we have some zero cycles on modular curves. Now I want to use it as a tool to study some one cycle on a threefold related to the modular curve. Well, recall our Chow Higgler construction. If you explicitly compute this Chow Higgler divisor, you can even get a representation, a representation of it. Um, so it was originally constructed as a zero cycle on a threefold, then we project it down, right? You can actually put it into a zero cycle in, a, in C crossing on the surface. And if you direct compute it, what you get is this is my C cross C, and this is my delta, my diagonal in C cross C, and this is a graph of my cell correspondence Z. Actually, it turns out that the Chow Higgler divisor is just given by three parts. One part is the intersection between the Z and diagonal inside C cross C. And then you subtract some horizontal intersection. This is like C cross, uh, let's see, this is C cross E intersecting your Z and some vertical intersection. Okay. And if I take my E to be a cusp in the modular curve case, if I take my E to be a cusp, then this intersection is just formed by cusps. This is form of cusps. Um, and I can take a Z to be a hacker correspondence. So if I want to prove this, um, the Chow Higgler divisor to be non torsion, really, I just need to prove Z intersect my 
diagonal to be non-torsion. Uh, well, minus some multiple costs. You can think about this as all costs. Okay. Now let's think about what are the points on C on the intersect delta. Well, delta. Let's think about the modular interpretation. Delta is my uh, delta is my diagonal. Z is a hyper correspondence. It parametrizes the curve to isogeny, right? If I'm on the intersection. That means my elliptic curve has a self-isogeny of a certain degree that other elliptic curves shouldn't have. Namely, this intersection, as long as I take my z to be a non-square, non non-perfect square number of a hypercorrespondence, it will be supported on CM elliptic curves, which means that this intersection is a linear combination of hacker divisor, of, of Higgler divisors, right? And we know how to show non-triviality of Higgler divisors. It'd be really nice if we could prove the non-triviality of this linear combination, because then we'll be done, right? I pick a, a type of correspondence, I get a linear combination of Higgler divisors. If I can prove this linear combination is non-portion, I'm done. But unfortunately, it's not, that's not how we did it. It's not immediately clear how to show this linear combination is non-portion. Instead, what we did is we prefix a non-portion Higgler divisor, which we know exists, from the by the n sufficient large. And then we prove there exists a linear combination of hacker correspondences, Z, such that it, it cuts out that prefixed Higgler divisor. Okay. So and this is the same this okay, of course, when I was working on this problem, I would like to prove non-triviality for X naught of n. The reason we are proving for this particular group, Congress R group, is because the following theorem. So I have my Higgler divisor non-torsion in here. Okay. We would like to construct some one cycle in here such that when I pull back, this is my diagonal embedding. When I pull back, it gives me my Higgler divisor. But currently we were having trouble constructing special divisors on X not one cross X not one that directly pulls back to what I want. Instead, if I raise the level, we were able to construct, we were able to construct special divisors on X of N this with this congress of group, such that when I pull back via the diagonal embedding and the push forward gives me this prefixed non-torsion divisor. So this means that um, the chow Higgler divisor of the pullback I got here was non-torsion. That implies the the so y cycle I cared about for associated to this x lower n was non torsion. Okay, so this is all I want to talk about. Um, thanks for coming, and uh, any questions are welcome. <laughs>